Okay, I think the, the numbers have steadied off actually. So welcome. Um, I don't know where people are calling from, but it's uh, early evening here. So good evening and uh, good morning or afternoon if you're calling from other parts of the world, because obviously SIWEM, this is worldwide webinar. But welcome to a Welsh branch event, SIWEM event, so, uh, supported by IC Wales Cymru. So welcoming uh, members also from ICE today, not just SIWEM. Um, I just got a few housekeeping notes before um, we start and I introduce Clive. First thing is, if anybody's got any technical issues with Zoom, can you kindly use the chat function and someone in SIWEM Barbara will hopefully help you out. And then um, questions will be at the end of the presentation. So if you can use the Q&A facility for questions that you may think of throughout the presentation, and then we'll go through as many as we can at the end. So yeah, so, so welcome uh, to, to today's event. Um, uh, th this event is being recorded and will be made available on SIWEM's YouTube uh, channel afterwards. And Clive has kindly agreed for the, pres no, the presentation to be shared via this function. And it does count towards CBD, although we do not provide CBD certification, it will be attributable to your CBD hours. Um, so yes, yeah, so welcome. Um, in the chat function, we'll share events and, and interesting links as we go through. So hopefully if, you, if there's anything there, you can pick it up from the chat function. And this is part of SIWEM's Climate Ecological Emergency Declaration Series. And I think hopefully I've covered, um, there, there are a few events coming up in, in Wales of which um, the flooding conference is to be determined and any other events we'll put in the chat so we don't list off a load now you'll be able to pick them up from there and don't forget uh, both ourselves and IC have event pages where all the events are held so thank you very much um, so I'd like to welcome Clive Wormsley our speaker for this evening he's going to talk about reflections on COP26 a Welsh perspective of the impacts on climate change policy and action. Clive, is, um, you've been working in the climate change sector for over 20 years and is currently the Senior Specialist Advisor for Climate Change in Natural Resources Wells, or NRW, as well as you know working uh, leading on strategic climate change issues across Wales and chairing the UK interagency climate change group along with many other things as well as leading on our participation in COP26. So welcome Cl now Clive you're going to take control and I'm going to hide myself and mute myself and then we'll monitor the Q&A and chat as we go through. So thank you. Okay. Welcome Clive. Thanks Tracy. Uh, hopefully you can uh, all hear me clearly. And uh, yes, so, well, you've already heard what the title is and who I am. <clears throat> so thanks, Tracy. Um, so the, the the reasoning for, for this talk, and, and, and you might think, well, why, why, why are we talking about COP26 when it happened uh, over six months ago now? Um, but it was it was really when Tra I had a discussion with Tracy um, about to just kind of be able to talk about really kind of reflecting on how it had, how it what impact it had had you know and it's obviously easier to have some reflections a while after the event um, and uh, I think it has had significant impacts and I, I, so I'm going to try and set those out I'm going to start with a wee bit of context and then I'm going to touch on kind of two questions that I was asked after attending COP I was I was there for um, most of the two weeks uh, of COP, um, and those two questions were, what what did you, how did you find it? What was the experience like? And also, was it uh, was it effective? Was it successful? So I'll be I'll be picking up on those on those uh, those two questions as, as as we go along. So I'm going to start with a little bit of context. Obviously, you know, we all know that 
the, the globe and Wales and the UK. And obviously, you know, most the majority of places uh, globally are, are, are on a warming trend and the uh, these uh, warming stripes as they became have become known um, are a very graphical way of presenting it. And you can see here the temperature change for Wales since 1884 through to um, through to actually it says 2022 it should say 2021 to 2021 so very up to date and and what is very clear from this is that the last decade is the is very much the warmest on record so we are climate change isn't a thing of the future it is very much a a reality of the present and another bit of context is that obviously over recent years there's been an awful lot of uh international uh, collaboration to understand the impacts and to uh, also understand how um, attributing climate change firstly to understand that climate change is caused by human Im impacts um, and more recently there's been since the establishment of IP IPBS which is the kind of sister panel to the IPCC so the IPCC is the climate change panel and the uh, IPBS is the uh, if you like the biodiversity um, uh, equivalent panel and they they both produced landmark reports a number of landmark reports over the last uh, two or three years starting with the report that IPCC commissioned or sorry ICP report that they produced commissioned uh, in, in many senses by the um, the UN Convention on Climate Change really to say what you know in terms of global warming what would 1.5 degrees mean? What would two degrees mean? Because at the Paris Agreement, there was uh, discussions around um, whether uh, the world should be limiting its temperatures to two degrees C above, uh, above pre-industrial or whether it should be 1.5 degrees C. And in essence, I'm not gonna go into any great detail, but in essence, the that report from the IPCC emphasized how important it was to try and achieve 1.5 because without that um, the impacts at two degrees would be would be much much greater particularly on some of the more sensitive ecosystems so for example coral reefs where uh, the, the, at 1.5 degrees c there would still be coral reefs although impacted um, whereas at two degrees c effectively coral reefs become uh, as far as the research suggests that, that they become more or less um, no longer viable as a and sustainable as a as an ecosystem um, and I think the other, the other thing which this report did was to to really really stress the the fact that the that threshold of 1.5 degree C was very much upon us and it could occur sometime between 2030 and 2052 allowing for the uncertainties with um, with, with climate projections. So as it says there in that quote there, uh, limiting global warming to 1.5 degree really does require a, a rapid and far reaching transitions um, uh, over the next few years. Uh, come on. Uh, I don't know why we had problems earlier i'm trying to advance the slides um wait a minute if you bear with me why has it done that okay right um yes and, and so bringing bringing things and th those reports that i just referred to were published back in 2019 uh, and, and, and 2021, but bringing it right up to date, um, both at the end of 2021 and also or in, in August 2021, the first part of the IPCC's latest assessment was published. And, and at the time, the uh, Secretary General of the UN was talking about code, it being a code red for humanity. And, and, and that report, again, kind of reinforced the, 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 the sense of urgency. And and that was kind of really captured in these five kind of takeaways from that report. Um, the fact that changes in climate are widespread, rapid, and, and they're intensifying. The fact that uh, human activities are indisputably causing climate change. There's no, no, no debate about that now. 
um, and and so making things like heat waves, heavy rainfall, and droughts more frequent and severe. And we've we you know we've got we continue to have a growing evidence base for that. I mean, even at this very uh, moment in time, you have um, a, a declaration of uh, emergency in it in northern Italy due to droughts, while you have incredible flooding events, unprecedented flooding events in. Uh, Parts of uh, New South Wales in Australia, and the the uh, the record of uh, uh, in increasing extreme events is uh, growing by the year. So it's it's another another key conclusion is that there's no going back for some of the systems, and the coral reef there, which I've already mentioned. Um, but of course, the impacts will be slowed, and and some could be stopped by uh, actually by actually kind of having a rapid reduction in emissions. So the take home message is unless we really do need immediate and large scale emission reductions uh, limiting warming. And clearly that statement from the IPCC was sent in August last year, very much as a, as a report and a message to COP26, um, making, making the case for, for, for action. So, Another piece of context to COP26 is that uh, going back now to, uh, well, end of 2018, it was in its infancy. By 2019, the UK climate emergency movement developed. And uh, I'm obviously putting this in a Welsh context with the list, which is here. But it was in April 2019 that the Welsh government declared a climate emergency. And then subsequently, also lots of local authorities and the, the vast majority of local authorities in Wales. I mean, there's just some of them listed there, but uh, at the time that I put this together, but there's but the vast majority have now declared an emergency and also many town and community councils, as well as universities and so on, have uh, declared an emergency. And you may say, well, what does by itself, what does that mean? But it has driven a uh well it's done two things i think one is that it has uh put pressure and uh motivated both councils and welsh government to take further action and to, to has certainly pushed climate change up the up the agenda the policy agenda um but the other the other thing that it's done is it's obviously uh at a kind of a social level it's meant that communities are more engaged and, and more aware and in, by increasing awareness it's obviously becomes more important and significant in terms of how how it uh, impacts in the in, in the way people um uh, kind of people's decision making so that that's all i wanted to say by way of background to this so so with that um against that background of uh, increasing urgency um, certainly in the run up to uh, COP in, uh, in Glasgow, which was held in these two venues that you can see on the uh, on the slide in front front of you. Um, there was an awful lot of talk about the the need for COP26 to be a success, but I think it's really important that it's seen in context in the sense that it is, um, as, as the phrase COP means, you know, it's the conference of the parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And it is at its heart a annual stock take discussion and negotiation of future um, uh, reductions in emissions, but particularly, but more recently, um, how to manage climate risk uh, and, and so on. Um, and in that sense, it, 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 this happens on an annual basis. So there will be COP27 coming up in. Uh, in, in, in later this year. Of course, as it happens with COP26, because of COVID, there was a was a two year gap. But so I think it's important to see that COP, it's, it's, it's difficult to judge COP26 as COP26 alone. It is, it is but one meeting in a series which uh, stretches back um, over the, well, more than the last two decades. I think in just in terms of uh, reflecting on a bit of experience of being at COP, the first thing to say was that it's very hard to grasp the, the scale of it and the fact that there was literally tens of thousands of people attending this venue and the queues 
the queues on the first couple of days when people were registering and arriving for the first time were quite legendary. Um, there was COVID testing. Um, this is back in the times when COVID was still very much uh, to the fore. So there was uh, COVID testing for everybody in order to get into the into the uh, well, even just into the grounds around the venue. And then there was also kind of full on airport style security um, in order to actually get inside the venue. Um, and then once in there, the, there is there is very much kind of, well, I would say I'll categorize it as three um, categories of activity. There's the there's the negotiations, the UNFCCC negotiations, um, and those, those, those are very much happen in the plenary sessions um, and I'll show you a slide which shows the plenary venue which you would have probably have seen on the, in the media anyway um, but there's then individual sub sub uh, meetings on specific topics along with a whole series of, of um, independently organized meetings on on a range of uh, climate reduction topics can be anything from uh, decarbonizing um, the uh, airline industry, decarbon uh, the impacts of deforestation, it, it, you name it. The, the, there's there's a whole suite of uh, different different topics that the, that are covered, and then alongside that, you also have pavilions. A lot of them are national, so there was the UK government pavilion, but a lot of other states um, have have their own pavilions along along with various. Uh, uh, some of the main e, um, international ENGOs have pavilions. <clears throat> so there's very, very much many dimensions. And the other dimension is, is obviously bilaterals, where, where there's literally, it could be anything from two people meeting to two governments meeting. And of course, you know, probably the, the, the highlight of COP26 in terms of that was the, um, the when, when, you know, the uh, Americans and the Chinese had, uh, came up with an agree a bilateral agreement. Uh, themselves. So this this just uh, these these are just more images from COP to to show how we, we've literally got from people having individual meetings sitting around tables in one of the one of the uh, uh, parts of the venue through to the um, the plenary session with, where there's uh, which is the more formal session. Um, so it, it it's a uh, it is it's really quite a huge event really. And just to move on and talk a little bit about my, my, my involvement, I was I was involved as a um, it, it both in well it, both in supporting events which were organised by along with colleagues from the other UK environment agencies, um, and you can see the one of the uh, it was actually the Scottish uh, Environment Minister uh, who was uh, speaking at, at an event that we organised there, but there was. We were involved in that sense, but we were also involved in supporting Welsh government um, at the event. Um, and I think it's probably quite important to say that the there's quite obviously a very large UK government uh, uh, delegation at, the, at this event, and there, um, there would be a sizable one at other COPs. But because it's obviously the the host, uh, the, 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 there's a much greater uh, representation. But the UK government um, team from Bayes and Defra uh, principally are involved in, and also in cabinet office are involved in the negotiations and actually Welsh government doesn't along with Scottish government as, as I understand it as is not really involved in that that end of things and I'll come on and talk about how how Wales is involved uh, a bit further in a minute the other thing to say about uh, about the event was that uh, it's well there's there's two there was two uh, and many of you may know this, but there was there was something called a blue zone, which is the main venue, and something called the green zone. And the blue zone is, is blue because it's the UN zone, and so they put the, the although it's the uh, UK hosting, effectively the main conference venue for the purposes of the, during the summit becomes effectively under the control of the UN, since the blue zone. And then the green zone is a is a separate zone, which where there's actually events for the public. Um, far more kind of exhibitions and so on, and it was possible to get tickets and uh, to 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 a wide range of events. Uh, and we had we had a presence uh, in both the, both the blue. Uh, when I say we, I mean the the UK agent uh, environment agencies had a presence in both um, 
both uh, during during the event. But the other thing I wanted to uh, flag up was it what what one thing which amazed me was the um, was the num the amount of uh, protests and protesters actually within the venue. So, so there was a you know as as you will probably many of you will have seen there was a there were major protests out on the streets of Glasgow. Uh, during during the event, and there were large demonstrations immediately outside the venue, such that at times when you were trying to leave the venue, the police were directing you to avoid um, large groups of protesters and so on. Um, but within the venue, and um, because partly because within the negotiations, um, indigenous peoples uh, uh, from across the globe um, uh, are invited by the UN and others to be involved uh, either involved in uh, in meetings or as, as observers then you actually find that there's a lot of kind of protests that go on actually within the venue i'm not i must admit myself i'm not quite clear as to the the success of them but they certainly are there making their making their voice voice known and just uh, just uh, another little insight i mean in in terms of the scale of the the event there is, there is the most huge canteen area there's a number of kind of facilities for buying food and drink but um another aspect of of cop was uh, a number of art installations and just illustrating there um it, it was like a skull of salmon which was um made out of a, a blown glass um, each one is is uh, individually hung from the ceiling um, basically to illustrate as an art installation and there's a, there's some interpretation there to demonstrate the, the the impacts that climate change is having on, on on salmon and salmon populations and there's a range of art installations around the, around the venue and it's also fair to say that obviously as a huge logistical operation it clearly the cop itself had a significant carbon footprint but uh and this was only one way of reducing that footprint but uh there was a significant effort to reduce the the footprint of the uh of the catering as well as uh not providing uh disposable uh kind of plastic cups and uh, and, and so on so and uh and maximizing recycling and so on So as I said a bit, as I said right at the start, I think one of the questions that I'd been asked is COP26, was it a success or was it a failure? And I think one of the reasons that this is because of the, the media, the media likes to try and portray it as either one or the other. And I would, I would, I would argue that actually it, it, it achieves certain things and it, it's, it's, a, it's a moment um, in time. It has moved things forward as I, as I'm going to, say in a minute and in a little bit more detail but uh, it, it has only prog made progress progress things so far and certainly not at the pace that one would ideally like to see so i'm going to start by just kind of talking about what was in the cop 26 agreement uh, in summary i'm really going to be this is going to be fairly brief and then talk about what i feel so this is going to be about what was in the cop agreement itself and then i'll talk about what i feel that wales has uh, has got out of it and most of the time i'm going to focus on the on the latter but just as a reminder some some key key uh, elements which came out from the glasgow climate pact and the and the conference was firstly i think uh, and this might this is probably rather buried away and certainly wasn't something that the media really strongly focused on but in terms of emissions, I think the kind of agreement to review nationally determined contributions annually, rather than every five years, is a is a major step forward. So I, I probably better describe what nationally determined contributions are. But so when the Paris Agreement was reached, um, unlike the Kyoto Protocol, which came before, where it, there was actually specific targets for each country had a specific target it had to meet in terms of its emission reductions. And you can argue that this was a kind of a bit of a cop out in a way, but what happened was that the um, each government was able to has been through these what what are termed nationally determined contributions, effectively set out in a plan uh, using a, a common framework what uh, what emission reductions and what policies it's going to introduce. Um, and when that was uh, conceived in, uh, and then of course the UN 
FCCC then collates all those and adds up what they all kind of add up to and then argues that there needs to be further further action. Um, uh, and, uh, as, and when that was first conceived in Paris, it was viewed that that would be reviewed every five years. But clearly, with the sense of urgency and, and the, well, the genuine urgency that there is for action, uh, one of the really important things is that they that will need, now be reviewed annually. So I think that's a really important <coughs> development, and it, in in and of itself, yet has not uh, has not achieved anything. But it would be interesting to see later this year whether those NDCs are uh, in, increased and ratcheted up with with more more policy action. But there there certainly will be pressure from both the UN and and certainly from certain groups like the, the group of island states to, to do so. The other thing to uh, say is that the, there was a lot of discussions around of the developing nation support. So that's providing funds and significantly increasing the money that is there to help support action in terms of them decarbonizing themselves, but also how they manage the significant and growing climate risk to that affects them and uh, there was amongst the countries which are the donor countries there they, there was uh, offers of more financial support so it's not as much as the developing nations wanted but there was progress with that regard um, there was an, another it's not on the slide there but another thing which was 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 a, a topic of uh, a significant topic at the event, and there was specific days debate, devoted to different topics. One, and one of which was on loss and damage, and that's really the concept that um, the vast majority of emissions which are causing climate change are being caused by the developed world, and therefore those those need to be, um, uh, if you like, compensated for in terms of providing the developing nations with um, support, additional support to compensate for that. Uh, loss and damage that's been caused as a result of uh, developed world uh, emissions in the past uh, and at present. Um, but those discussions really didn't make much progress, and, and I know that that's something that probably will end up being discussed further uh, when it when the uh, COP27 uh, happens in uh, in Egypt later this year. So uh, I think, uh, and it may seem amazing, but actually the Glasgow Climate Pact was the first time that a COP had agreed uh, explicit, an explicit plan to reduce coal use and what was disappointing was that right at the end because obviously there was a text that's produced about a week into the COP and then the second much of the second week amongst the negotiators is about refining that text um, uh, but what was disappointed it was to phase it, it was originally stated as phasing out but it became in the final text, it became phasing down. There was uh, some progress around subsidies, agreeing to phase out subsidies of fossil fuels, but there was no particular time frames agreed for that. So it was agreed in principle, but there's bound to be negotiations on that around trying to push for a time frame on it later this year. Um, I think one of the things which, particularly from an environmental agency perspective, and something that uh, most of those that I know from the agencies that have attended um, was there was there was a recognition that more, um, the role of nature was more explicitly recognised uh, than previously in, in in COPS, and so yeah, the, their role in in helping tackle climate change, but also acknowledging the potential impacts of climate change on ecosystems, was a was a topic that was. Uh, covered by the conference, but also there was uh, it featured in the in the you know more so than it had done previously in the in the final uh, the final climate uh, text, sorry, final conference text. Uh, the other thing to say, mention very briefly, is that it wasn't just about the overall agreement at the end of the conference. There were a series of separate agreements, and I just highlight two here on the slide. Um, one is me methane, a separate agreement to cut 30% of me me methane emissions by 2030. And that was agreed by over 100 countries. And another one on forests and deforestation, um, again, to, to try to stop for, uh, deforestation by 2030, again, with more than 100 countries. And, they, and those 100 countries cover uh, a, a large proportion, uh, around 85% of the world's forests. 
So, um, so there was some really positive developments, um, but clearly there could have been more. So, what what does it actually mean for for Wales? So, uh, is is the is the kind of final final topic for the, for my my talk really, and the, and in some senses the, the main one really. I think the first thing to say is that I think, and the, this is, and I should emphasise that this is my personal perspective on it, but uh, I think it has stimulated um, a better policy, uh, more progression in uh, decarbonisation and, and climate change policy. So uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of this. So one was that this is a what I'm referring to here is that in terms of Wales. So we have, in, in terms of policies, we have Welsh Government's low carbon delivery plan, the second version of it, which was published literally days before um, the, the start of COP, very much, very deliberately by the Welsh Government. And in the, in net zero Wales, that that really does, uh, it does progress um, the, the whole suite of actions uh, that, are being undertaken, and I think uh, COP26 provided a focus in in the first part of 2021 as that um, policy was developed um, to to drive action. Then um, I'll just talk a little bit about more about Net Zero Wales. So um, it's basically about just as the UK has carbon bu budgets, there's, there's Welsh carbon budgets. So there's a the 2016 to 2020, the first carbon budget, which has just been reported on actually, where we did achieve 40% reductions in uh, emissions compared to a 1990 baseline, which was which was good to see, good to see. But although it's partly driven at the very end in the last year by COVID uh, impacts on on emissions, but um, the point is that the Net Zero Wales really sets out a plan of action for all the things. 123 policies and proposals across all aspects of Welsh government's competencies, um, covering a wide diversity of topics, things from the just transition, uh, the need to, to include skills, thinking about innovation, as well as then sector, so, so these kind of generic elements, but also then in terms of energy transport, um, the um, land use sector, uh, domestic sector. Um, so all of the industry, all of these sectors, public sector, all of the, all of those uh, sectors are covered within this plan. And I think there was definitely a drive to add additional uh, targets and objectives, um, partly driven from within Welsh Government, but also with um, support from others. And just as it says there on the bottom uh, the bottom left, you can see that there was 118 pledges from other organisations and individuals which committed to taking action. And so there were NRW made a pledge, but um, the WLGA, the Welsh Local Government Association, on behalf of the local authorities, made made a pledge. So there was a there was a lot of sizable pledges made by others as as well as Welsh Government within within that plan. And the other th one that I won't talk very much about, but is obviously you know delivering on uh, climate change in Wales, as part of the UK, what, whatever the UK government sets out is, equ is 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 equally important. And they there was the net zero strategy uh, published in October 21. Again, immediately just ahead of the COP, which really um, has kind of set set the agenda. And I think there was a, there was a drive for both within government and from outside government from ENGOs to get to make this stronger, very much in the run up to COP. Um, uh, so I think that was it, it had a positive effect on that. The next uh, aspect I, I just wanted to um, mention was that so COP actually does contribute to the, both the development and also becoming signatories of international agreements. So while Wales isn't involved in the negotiations per se, what it is involved in uh, is, is in various sub international subgroups. So, uh, so Wales and probably the, the you know one of the main things was that Wales became a founding uh, and core member of the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, which admittedly brings together a relatively small number of states. Um, 
sorry, I don't know why it's doing that, but uh, it's a relatively small number of states, but it does uh, signal, including uh, countries such as Denmark, uh, kind of that there is now a core of countries that want to move, want to um, uh, avoid avoid uh, and manage the phase out of uh, oil and gas production. Uh, the other, there's another couple of uh, groups that uh, Wales signed up to a global MOU on um, zero emission HGVs, uh, and and they have committed to moving to 100% zero emission new trucks and buses from 2040, um, with an interim goal of 30% by uh, by by uh, 2030. I'm sorry about the problem with the slide. I've obviously got some automatic. I didn't do this earlier, but anyway. And then also, it's Wales is a founding member of the under, under two coalition. So, um, what is uh, what is impressive is that there is, as well as obviously the, the member state negotiations, there is also uh, a, a kind of a lot, a major kind of uh, representation from state American states like California and. Is, is one important one, but all, many of the US states, uh, Canadian provinces, Australian uh, territories and, and, and states, um, um, states and regions, as, as, as it's termed, and the under two coalition brings together a lot of the, there's a, a coalition of the states and regions, which actually is something which actually is driving potentially reductions across 50% um, uh, of the global emissions. And so Wales's involvement in that is particularly important too. The other thing I wanted to fe uh, feature was that it's very much driving greater UK level collaboration. And, this, and I'm thinking about this more from the point of the UK environment agencies. So we have, as uh, Tracy briefly mentioned at the beginning, we have something called the UK Interagency Climate Change Group, which uh, I'm not gonna read out who's in it, but you can see that Natural Resources Wales from Wales is in it along with all the various England and Scotland and Northern Ireland environment agencies. And we've been, I mean, this, this group um, has existed for, for many, many years now, but actually the, the having COP26 uh, here, well, here in the UK, in Glasgow, very much stimulated uh, quite a lot of activity and kind of brought the uh, full range of agencies together um, particularly with the the chairs and chief execs of the agencies expressing interest in being involved and one of the things we did was we had discussions with IUCN and IUCN the International Union for Conservation Nature have produced this global standard for nature-based solutions and one of the things which was at the conference at the um, at COP that was uh, was stressed was uh, the potential value of nature-based solutions in, in in addressing climate change and so we we produced we had we had a, a stand. This was actually within the the green zone rather than the blue zone, um, where we which we hosted uh, collectively as the agencies, highlighting some of the um, the case studies that we have. And I'll say a bit more about them in a minute. Um, and it's it, it, it's interesting how this the diversity of audience that we had were ranging from everything from school groups, students, through um, small small SMEs, uh, to those occasionally those involved in negotiations. And um, this was the, um, is the Minister of Finance for the Maldives, who also have to be, happened to be the Vice President of the uh, UN General Assembly, who came past and was interested because of the, because of the Maldives, obviously being very, very vulnerable to, to climate change and uh, the importance of their ecosystems and the fragility of their ecosystems. So, it it was interesting that to, in in terms of the range of uh, people that we uh, we engaged with um, at, at at the conference. Um, and just to highlight that we we also um, as UK agencies collaborative collaborated in advance of COP um, on another um, output, which I think is going to be posted in the. The chat, but uh, the Nature Positive 2030, which was really with having all, getting all the UK agencies coming together, or all, all UK nature conservation agencies, as featured on the logo at the bottom, logo list at the bottom, um, and, and thinking about okay, what is it we we all have um, devolved policy around nature conservation, but what do we need to do collectively? What what is what is what is this? What are the common elements that we need to um, Set, set out to achieve uh, 
a turnaround and moving to a nature positive status by 2030 well, how, how do we do that and so the wheel on the on the uh, on the right um, highlights at a very high level which obviously goes into far more detail within the report some of the priorities which were drawn out through those um, UK UK level discussions um, so I think again it's just another another example of something which an initiative which happened and was very much born out of what are we, what are we going to do for COP26 so I think the other aspect was uh, another aspect was reinforcing the synergies between uh, climate and nature emergencies I already mentioned this actually so I won't dwell on it but as I say we've already we were we were able to highlight uh, and if you look at the the link which has been posted um, there's a, a whole range of uh, nature-based solution projects from across the, all of the four nations of the UK that were presented uh, and, and this is actually building on this we're, we're looking to um, do some further analysis on a wider suite of um, NBS projects from across the UK um, to, to, to look at their what lessons learned from them and the two that we had from Wales was a uh, uh, we had we had one which was the um, Penicomoy um, wind farm and the uh, peatland restoration work that has been undertaken there. And in, by way of uh, a large contrast, the other one that we we highlighted was the um, was the Green Grange House, Greener Grange Town project uh, down in uh, down in Cardiff, um, where you know using uh, sustainable urban drainage um, and also engaging with the community. There's been major environmental gains and reductions in uh, energy use for pumping water, as well as uh, uh, producing a more uh, attractive set of uh, streets within the community. I'm actually going to move on from that one. Um, and then the other thing that the, the obviously Welsh government was very keen on was showcasing Welsh action and also exchanging ideas with such an international audience. Uh, and, and also learning from others. And uh, you'll see, you can see here some photos from events that um, I was involved in um, and others, uh, an event that was organized by Welsh government at the top with the Mark Drake for the first minister there. And also an event that was organized by the UK interagency group uh, down the bottom. But um, I just thought I'd highlight that really in terms of Wales, and these these are, these are actually courtesy of Welsh government, but Welsh government's object, aims and objectives for COP was very much to catalyse action both at home and abroad, and to share, share and learn ideas, um, and also show the world what we are doing as a globally responsible nation. So um, those those were kind of amongst the key the key priorities. There are some others there about raising the profile of Wales and um, promoting trade. And I think one of the things which was Welsh government's approach was very much to not that I'm here to speak on behalf of Welsh government, but it was very clear that Welsh government and also to a extent ourselves were looking to uh, well not sell but 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 promote uh, an understanding of the distinctive Welsh approach to net zero um, action, um, having a kind of the Minister of Climate Change and a, and a super ministry. Uh, structure that obviously came in last year. Um, the role of the Wellbeing Future Generation Act. Uh, there's 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 a wide recognition that that is a, a very forward-looking um, act and, and uh, legislation, as well as uh, looking at um, talking about things like um, how things are embedded across across government and also the the role of the Welsh public sector. And this this happened in alongside kind of meetings with indigenous people. I've already mentioned indigenous people, but I know that the, from speaking to the minister, um, there was discussion around that um, and the value of speaking to people to understand how the, the way we live lives in Wales impacts uh, people elsewhere in the world. Um, and then, oh, sorry. Apologies for the little problems with the slides. Um, yeah, so and I think other there was also the engagement with youth. There was quite a lot of youth climate ambassadors there. Um, so that was another important element, as well as um, uh, as well as the kind of 
being uh, opportunities to exchange ideas, not just with uh, nation states and regions, but also with community representatives and so on. So, yeah, and the, the, the final element that I just wanted to, to mention is around uh, raising awareness um, and building a Team Wales approach and driving the action in Wales. Um, so in advance of COP, there was very much in discussion with Welsh Government, there was very much an idea that the presence at, at COP should be not just Welsh Government, as well as obviously UK Government, but should also include agencies such as NRW, but it should also, WLGA were involved, the, the Welsh Local Government Association, but there was obviously some of the NGOs, um, Centre for Alternative Technology. Um, there was quite, there was a number of different Welsh bodies that were involved um, in bringing different messages and being engaged in different ways. But it wasn't all about just going to COP. It was very much about ensuring that COP came to Wales as well. So there was uh, something called COP Cymru, which uh, started with the launch of uh, the Net Zero, uh, Net Zero Wales plan. Uh, and before the conference, there were a series of regional Wales roadshows, and then Wales Climate Week happened um, immediately afterwards. And uh, yeah, so I think, I think the, key, the key point to say here is really about taking the message back to Wales through the media um and that was a uh, that was that was also an important thing to 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 be to come out of it and so those those are the uh the the the, the range of um if you like positives that i feel that came out of the event um and hopefully i've given you a, a flavor of my experience at cop but also of what i feel wales has gained from from the event and i'll just leave you there with um there was actually a, a whole wall which was devoted to a whole set of cartoons to uh in one in one of the uh the, the areas where you could uh sit and uh, and have take a break so i'll i'll leave with you though with leave you with those and hand back to uh tracy oh, thank you very much hopefully i'm turn my video back on and you can see me. Uh, we've had some um, chat going on, and I know you've shared a lot of links. Um, if anybody wants to join Welsh Bank's link LinkedIn group, I'll put all the links in there as well, so that it's available in another location for you, as well as our Facebook Welsh Branch page. If you're on social media, there'll be another option where I'll share the links uh, to this presentation for those who haven't been able to copy them or get access to them all. But we've had a few questions come in. Um, I've, I have clocked the ones that have come in on the chat as well. Um, I'm gonna do them in order of how I've read them as well, to be fair. So um, Clive, Steve Morgan um, asks, there was some challenge uh, relating to whether future, well, with this and future COPs, should be more low carbon, i.e. hybrid or virtual. What's your views on this? Okay. Yeah, no, I'm happy to happy to address that. As I said, I think there was an effort to yeah, the the event was on a very large scale. It clearly has does have a significant carbon impact, but if you look at it on a global picture, not so much so. But the point I would make is that uh, there was efforts made to reduce it at the event. The, there was an argument, and, the, and it wasn't for uh, environmental reasons. There was an argument put for it being virtual or partly virtual because of COVID. Um, the, the thing I would say was that the um, developing nations, and particularly the small island states, many of those who are, are most vulnerable to climate change, those countries were very adamant they wanted it physically. Um, and it was actually largely, I think, driven by the emphasis that they felt that they couldn't properly engage, partly because for a number of reasons. I think they felt they actually wanted to be there. And actually, as I mentioned during the, the presentation, there was quite a lot of uh, demonstrations and so on, which obviously wouldn't have worked online. And I think there was a, so there was a, there was a desire to be there physically. 
Um, but the other thing is that I think realistically, um, as we all know, uh, virtual can work well for some things, but actually to actually undertake negotiations, um, I think I think it's much harder to do negotiating uh, online. Uh, not impossible. So, will, will it happen? Um, it certainly there, there was a lot of the events were streamed online. So, it, what what was positive was that, um, including a lot of the events that, that 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 I was involved in, that you could you could join them. So other people could join them. Um, but I think the idea that there would never be a COP, which would be face to face, is unlikely. Maybe some of the side events can go online. But I think the actual heart of the negotiations would probably always be face to face is my is my is my take on it. OK, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, Claire, sorry if I pronounce your surname wrong here, Claire, Claire Gronel says, um, we, uh, she salutes all the work that's been going on you know, with us, with yourself and government and indigenous peoples and NGOs, etc. But after 26 meetings, there's no sign of carbon emissions slowing down, let alone getting to zero. Um, is it time to try something else or do you think COP process really can deliver something concrete? OK, um, well, I think... Yes, if you put it like this, it's very hard to say it hasn't delivered. So, so as I, as I mentioned, you know, it, within the UK and within Wales, you know, we have we we have reduced our emissions, uh, and those are territorial emissions, admittedly, but our, our emissions in Wales have reduced by forty percent compared to nineteen ninety. Um, the same is true of the UK. There are many countries where they where emissions are falling. But there are also, admittedly, others that where it, are, where, there, where it isn't such that overall, uh, globally, the emissions aren't yet falling. But they have, they, they do show signs of flattening out, and we do need to turn the curve very quickly. But I would, I would, I would argue that it's not true to say that it's achieving nothing. I agree, the pace needs to be greater, or it should have been much greater in the past, and it and, than, than it has been. But we are where we are. So, I think I think uh, I think that the challenge is 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 that there needs to be action at international level, but also more so at national, regional, community, and individual level. So, yes, it, should we explore other things? That I, I don't know whether she suggested anything specifically as a an alternative approach, but yes, we need to we need to adopt. Well, we need to use everything to use a phrase, we need to use every trick in the toolbox to um, to try and uh, tackle the issue. Okay, thank you. And we did have an email sent in in advance of the talk today from a colleague in Ding Dingbyshire Council. And they asked, is there a place for a carbon market or using carbon credits to simplify the UN FCCC goals? That's a mouthful, um, and make it easier for public and companies to contribute to tackling climate change. So, effectively, okay. is there a place, yeah, for carbon and carbon credit? Yeah, this is a, there's there's widespread debate about the value of carbon markets and whether carbon markets are the solution. Um, I think they will only ever be part of the solution. I think I think they're one of the things which could kind of be added to the mix i mean in a sense the carbon markets we have we already have carbon markets so like the 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 eu ets the uk uh, ets of which big industry in wales is part um and there is obviously there are now developing uh, ets uh, emissions trading schemes within uh, places like china i mean um north uh, us lots of Lots of countries are developing their own uh, effectively uh, uh, emission training schemes, that, uh, which are effectively kind of carbon markets. Uh, I mean, the, the value of them is only as strong as what the price of carbon is. I and mean, that's always been the thing which has been uh, said to be the case for things like the EU ETS, which has been around for quite a lot of years, which the, the, the price wasn't high enough to influence behavior and, and, and change decision making. Um, but there is a growing use of carbon markets and then there's there's newer things 
such as the uh, the UK UK um, Woodland Carbon Code. Um, there's now a, a Woodland as a Peatland uh, Carbon Code um, and potential for other other elements. So, yeah, carbon markets are something which may help, but it's certainly not a panacea. OK, thank you. And George Baker, the chair of Welsh Branch, <laughs> has sent a question in for you. Um, how do you well, how do you feel about the future and how will Wales specific how will Wales specifically cope with climate change? OK. Uh, how do I feel about the future? I'm, I, um, I think I think it's I think there are reasons to be positive. I think there are re reasons to be frustrated and uh, feel that progress isn't fast enough. So I I think there's a there's a bit of a mixed picture. I think that uh, well, basically within the UK. We, we actually had one of the things that I didn't actually mention, which is quite important, actually, in a sense, if, if you're not aware of it, is that all of these agreements in inverted commas, none of them are necessarily legally enforceable. So they don't have the league. They're not legally enforceable. So they are effectively countries agreeing to do things and signing up to doing things. But then if they didn't don't do them, there is there are, there are no particular kind of costs to, to them. But but nevertheless, I think it does still drive action. But one of the things which we've done in, in Wales, in Scotland and the, and the UK government, um, we've actually put our carbon budgets and our carbon targets and the net zero by 2050 objective. Um, and actually, it's, it's a bit earlier in Scotland. Those have been put into law. So they are they are there as, uh, legally. And some countries have done that. And I think one of the big things which has happened, a, a real positive um would be the fact that now uh, over three quarters of the world's emissions are in countries which have set a goal of of uh, um net, reaching net zero so and of course that is only talk, that's only a target it's only talk what it, it, it's always down to action but i do think i do think if countries can be persuaded to put uh the requirement to meet their budgets into law so it, that will that will be something which would be provide a bit of a lever and that would make me much more positive um in terms of the second half of the question was about um sorry can you remind me what the was second about, bit was yeah it was about how well specifically will cope with climate yeah. change okay so that's more about the impacts on wales i, I mean compared with most of the development most of the developing world uh, where people are less uh, have less capacity to adapt uh, and manage the impacts. I mean, we we are not in a bad looking at it in a global way, global picture. We are not in a bad position um, in the sense that we do. You know, we're a relative part of a relatively well, wealthy nation that has has the resources to 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 manage manage the impacts of climate change, and also by virtue of our relatively temperate climate. And so on. I think we're, we, we are in, in a relatively good position with. Um, but having said that, the there's there's no way of getting away from the fact that the the impacts of climate change will grow through time, and that the impacts on Wales will be significant, uh, and 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 that we do need to to spend much more effort on understanding what those impacts are likely to be, what the risks are, understanding the climate risks, and actually managing those risks through time. Um, and that is something that we really, uh, when we talk about climate change, a lot of the focus tends to be on how do we reduce our emissions and how do we save energy and so on. But so, um, yeah, so every country in the world is going to be significantly impacted, um, but but Wales perhaps less than average. Because it's worth adding that the government commissioned the climate change risk assessments report three came out recently which lists the impacts on the yeah. sectors in Wales so that's a good point place to go uh, if you want to see what the impacts to water transport etc and what risks there are and an action plan there as well I hope no absolutely that. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, there's there's That's just to say a little bit a little bit more on that because obviously I didn't cover yeah. that in the present. No. But there's there's 61 risks um, which were set out in the climate change risk assessment three, and the key thing to say is that the vast majority of them are are, are kind of red. Need more action now. Um, and the, the proportion which need urgent action has has grown since it, it was last done five years ago. So the need the need to act on on uh, climate impacts is uh, very much uh, a priority now. Okay, and um, thank you. Um, I have another question here uh, from Steve Morgan. Says, um, was the link between climate change and widening of health inequality? qualities discussed at COP26 and if so where can he find the latest information because he's interested because he's on the Gwent Public Service Board and, and like to use it to inform the wellbeing plan. Any thoughts? Yeah uh, yes I, th I mean there was certainly there certainly was discussion discussion around the impacts of climate change on health and the role of uh, health improvement uh, in addressing climate change, I particularly thinking of it from the point of view of climate impacts. Um, I'm sure that uh, I could probably I could probably kind of uh, uh, kind of point towards uh, some resources. Um, that, so pop, there was Public Health England certainly had a a, a profile at, at COP. Um, and and the and the World Health Organization obviously was 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 involved there, so um, I'd probably first of all go and have a look at look at their websites and and actually I can probably probably point point to a couple of links on that. Yeah. Is it worth? Um, I don't know whether you want to make your people to contact you via email or if you want to sh share the links with me and then I put them somewhere. I don't know how people get I'm access happy. to those. You happy for your email to be shared or well i'm happy to happy to send the, send the links to you send them to me yeah, okay yeah, great yeah, yeah, yeah. um and, and there's another question that's come in the chat um from uh tanya white i think sorry if i pronounced your name wrong there uh do you feel having seen this closer up that there is sufficient penalty in the agreements between the oe OECD countries, for example, for not achieving results, and that ownership of these is not yet felt fully, where pledges aren't delivered. So basically, do you feel sufficient penalty for those who agree to do it but then don't? Mm, okay, I, well, I kind of partly answered this already, really, because the yeah. the, the reality is that the all of these agreements, I mean. They they talk about signing and they are signed. I mean, a minister or whatever will sign them off, but they are they are policy agreements. They're not they're not they have no specific legal legal standing if a, if a if a country fails to reach whatever target it sets for reducing its emissions. Uh, the the only it can only be legally enforceable at the at a national level if if the country puts it into law. So. Um, that is a, that is that is a huge weakness, but I, I I guess it, and I can't really put myself in those shoes. But but if you imagine, there was obviously a two there was two first two days there were the world leaders were there, and I think there is a bit an element of simple competition and well I don't want to look to be <laughs> look to be the one that's letting the side down sometimes, um, so it's it, it's more about making pledges and seeking agreement so uh, in terms of to answer the question specifically yes i would argue probably there is a, a lack of um a lack of any kind of stick for countries that fail uh, and, the, and the danger is that some countries succeed and others fail but quite frankly i suspect you know, as we've seen with the take up of renewables, as I think we'll see with EVs and with various other developments, actually, those countries which are early adopters are probably going to uh, build a better world and reap the benefits before others. So what's not, what's not to like? But clearly, the, the, the cost of doing that is significant. And that's another, actually, just a really important point is that 
the UK Committee on Climate Change, when it looks at all that we need to do in the UK to um, to get to net zero, clearly it has huge capital costs, but those capital costs are, are significantly less than the than the savings and cost benefits of not having to buy fossil fuels and uh, and all the impacts and negative impacts of pollution, etc. All those things. The, it means that actually the, the upfront investment is definitely going to reap, reap, reap the benefits sooner. Okay, thank you. Um, it appears to be no more Q&A questions available. Um, I have picked up on a point that Claire mentioned earlier when you were talking about coal mining and the phasing out versus the, the phasing down. And she noted, which I'm quite interested in, Welsh Government haven't they just allowed the expansion of coal mining? Is that true? And if that's the case, uh, what what's your views on on that? I mean, I'm assuming coal mining in Wales is quite quite small compared to the global scale. But yeah, what's your views? Well, well, yeah. I mean, there, there, there's a bit of politics in here, so I'll I'll, I'll be careful what I say. But but um, but my my take on this is that. Is that there is there are there are there's a legacy of existing mines and and extractions, which which have licences, and then there's a there are different views between the UK government and the Welsh government as to who is responsible for uh, extending those licences, and and this has led to a perception by some that the, the Welsh government have approved further coal mining, but it but but it's continued continuity of existing uh businesses rather than establishment of new ones as, as as i understand it although i'm no expert on it so uh, um i meant one thing i did mention in the presentation was that they you know they welsh government signed up to be a member of this uh beyond oil and gas alliance and i think that the very fact they've done that will put added pressure on welsh government to ensure that no future concessions are granted because that's the that's the bottom line. The, 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 the agreement is that no future concessions are granted and then that there is a progressive phase out of oil and gas going forwards. So uh, hopefully, whatever whatever the truth of what's happened um, in relation to the coal mine that, that was being mentioned in the question, nevertheless, that that is we are on that trajectory to phasing out coal. Yeah. Also worth noting that I know that the water industry is also very um, signed up to being net zero by 2030 and any future options or development such as reservoir schemes etc across England and Wales would have to you know, take consideration of carbon emissions and do a detailed assessment before they think about doing anything so that's worth noting. Although, interestingly, it was one of the areas that had medium impact from a climate change perspective. So it wasn't red, but obviously clearly a role to play for the water industry there. I, I think we've concluded the questions. Uh, nobody else has put anything in since I said there wasn't any there. So I'd like to wrap things up and let everybody get off for their tea. So thank you. Virtual claps, I'm sure, all around, Clive, for your talk. and. It, once um, you know, Siwen has edited, you know, just chopped off our chit chat at beginning and end of the presentation that will be made available via YouTube, and we will put links and things on the LinkedIn Welsh branch page and the Facebook page, and I will share relevant information with ICE Cymru as well, so they can share it with their members, of course, because I don't have access to those social media areas. So, and please note on the events pages, etc. both organisations, they should all be on the diary there. So thank you very much, Clive, for, for that. And and I'm sure George, the chair, will also share in the thanks for, for you as well. Um, you've got lots of praise going down the side, if you can see the chat there, Clive. I can, thank you very much. So thanks, Tracy. Yeah, I think we'll draw it to a close then. So good evening or, or good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.